The White Unicorn, Bedtime Short Stories for Kids, a collection of fantasy and classic stories with 101 positive affirmations to help children fall asleep and relax. Aesop's Fables and Fairy Tales, written by Martha Shannon, narrated by Tippy Robinson and Donna Jackson. Part 1. Bedtime Stories for Kids Introduction The goal of meditation is very simple. It is to leave behind all your worries, thoughts, and aspirations, and to replace them with self-awareness. There are many different types of meditations used to achieve these ends. They include things like loving-kindness meditation, full-body scan meditations, and even mantra-based meditations. It is common for them to use narration or script. These are designed to be read aloud, usually by a second party, like a meditation leader or instructor. Many books on meditation are sold in audiobook form or on cassette so that the listener needs only to follow the instructions of the script. A good meditation script is one that allows the listener to relax and slowly transcend into the meditative mood. This is supported by vivid imagery and the soothing, slow-paced speech of the narrator. The idea is to listen intensely to the script and be overtaken by it. That way, the mind moves away from all the negative and energetic feelings of the day. Once attention is diverted from the ego to the script, the meditation can begin. A script that is done and executed well by the narrator and sometimes accompanied by soothing music can transport the listener into a different world. Usually, this world exists in the crossroads between present awareness and a higher state of being. A script can have specific instructions, or it may have general suggestions. The rest is up to the listener to devise images in their mind's eye. These meditations can be done at any time of the day, or when a listener is feeling stressed. But, in the case of bedtime stories as mindful meditation, it is best listened to shortly before sleeping or as one goes to sleep. Mindful meditation has been repurposed into the bedtime story and has breathed new life into the genre. Now, overworked adults listen to bedtime stories to help ease their minds. It can also be a form of self-therapy for whatever problems they are facing. Children, in particular, stand to benefit from these stories doubtedly so. First, they are receiving the soothing sounds and mindful meditations, which can help slow down their rapidly processing young brains. Toddlers and young children who cannot seem to sit still will enjoy a bedtime story being narrated to them. The child or toddler does not need to think about the stories. All they have to do is listen. There is some debate about whether the child even has to understand the language fully. We all know that reading to our children has the benefit of increasing their vocabulary from a young age. Children starting kindergarten, who have their parents read to them on a regular basis, will consistently score better on language acquisition tests. Sometimes the child is simply happy to hear the voice of a narrator that is not their parents. Add some soothing background music and dim the lights of their room a little, and then magic happens. The child begins to slow down and think about what is being said by the narrator. Secondly, Children benefit from these stories because they all have a central theme or lesson that a child can take with them. These are in the form of important life lessons, like 
learning how to make friends, or the importance of being honest. Many of these lessons are the same ones being taught in popular educational kids' television, like Sesame Street and The Electric Company. But unlike those popular TV shows, these mindful meditations substitute the visual element of the TV screen with the auditory and language elements of the meditation script. This encourages the child to use their imagination actively and to make those crucial connections between the significance of words and their pronunciation. Your child will enjoy them either through headphones or from audio speakers. They are each designed to put your child into a state of relaxation and active imagination. The interactivity of these stories comes in the form of communication between the narrator and the child. The scripts regularly ask rhetorical questions and use proper nouns, like eyes, and we are to simulate a conversation between the narrator and the child. To them it appears like the narrator is a different person on the other side of their imagination. And in a sense, that is the basis for most types of mindful meditations. It is to listen to the script and to imagine the narrator as being yourself, and at the same time, apart from yourself. There is no particular instruction about how you should use these scripts. A child can listen to them for nap time, like in a classroom setting, or they can listen to them at night before bed. You may want to go over the stories with them afterward, though, both to stimulate their understanding of the story and the language, and to exercise their active imagination. Achieving Guided Meditation to Conquer Insomnia in Kids Run your mind through a series of relaxing images. Try to picture a serene compound with lush green grass and place yourself in it, seated calmly on a reclining chair, watching a water fountain bubble gently and feel the moist, gentle breeze waft past your nostrils. Let the chirpings of the birds soothe you to calmness in this dream place. Drop anything that distracts and frustrates you in another room and let meditation overwhelm you. Now, lay down and allow your legs to rest comfortably. Some individuals find placing their arms by their sides enhances the comfortable posture. Start noticing your breathing and pay attention to the physical movement linked to breathing, like your belly falling or rising. Concentrate more on the air, getting in and out of your nose and mouth. Accept that it is normal to have lots of thought bothering you, and that is because the mind rehashes the day or gets preoccupied in trying to solve many pending issues. Learn to acknowledge these habits and then try to let them solve themselves. Mentally label anything that gets your attention and focus on it when breathing. Now, exhale and inhale. Take note when you get trapped in frustration, effort, or fear with compassion for yourself. Hold these thoughts of frustration or self-judgment and come back to them again later. Remember, thoughts are just thoughts. Now, inhale and exhale. At this moment, there is nothing required to address or change. Take note mentally of where your thoughts vanish out and label them mentally as just thoughts. And again, take another breath and more breaths. Now, shift your focus to sensations in the body by moving awareness to physical sensations in your legs. It is not required of you to wiggle the toes or move the feet. At this stage, you just need to notice them by becoming aware of the pressure and the temperature of your heel against the blanket 
or the mat on the floor. Again, move your focus into your lower legs and take note of what is there to notice. Let go of any effort by relaxing and letting go. Now, through your pelvis and buttocks and into your abdomen and belly, feel any pressure or temperature. It is likely that you will acknowledge the up and down breathing, including any other physical sensations. You might also notice any reflection of emotion, such as anger or fear, in the stomach, expressed as tightness or tension. We will now move into the back, where most individuals contain tension in various ways such as relaxing the muscles and lowering the shoulders from the ears. At this point, willingly allow any need to adjust with the aim of relaxing. Now, shift your attention to your lower arms and hands without the need to move or change anything. Now it is time to walk through the neck and into the muscles of the face while noting any areas of tightness or pinching. Then, with gentleness, relax these muscles. Have a general awareness of the physical sensations throughout the body for a few moments. If still awake at this stage, invite your mind back to the breathing each time the mind tries to wander into the future or the past. Having an anchor is a critical feature of triggering and sustaining meditation to induce sleep for individuals with insomnia. Inhale and exhale with each breathing in or breathing out being counted. Remember to stop the count at 10 and start again. Stay with the sensation of breathing in case you find the counting to be another distraction. In sensing the breathing, try to feel the breath entering or exiting the body through the mouth or nose, including noting the falling or rising of your chest and belly. You can now relax and prepare for bed with these guided meditation scripts. Kindly listen to all of them one by one, or Choose what sounds right for the end of that day. It is the best guide to relax and calm down with your children and be assured of having them enjoy a restful night's sleep. The Unicorn and the Bear Brindle was a very special unicorn. She was bright white with a beautiful glowing gold horn. Brindle loved to make new friends and help people. Best of all, Brindle was a magical unicorn. Today was another day where Brindle found herself walking through the trees. It was shady and cool under the canopy of leaves. She thought about her new friend Leon and wondered how he was doing. On this day, she felt someone else in the woods. It was not sadness this time that she felt. Today, she felt someone very annoyed, and yet still in pain. She did not understand it, so she decided to go investigate. Eventually, she came across a large furry animal standing on its hind legs, batting at a beehive. She watched her for a while. The creature would stand up, bat at the beehive, which was just out of her reach. The bees would come out and swarm and sting her. She would have to sit back down and Brindle could feel that she was both annoyed and in pain. When the bees settled down, the creature would try again. Finally, Brindle came closer to find out what was going on. 
Hello, Brindle called out as she got closer. My name is Brindle. I can see that you're having trouble, but I don't understand what you are trying to do. The creature looked over at Brindle with annoyance. I am Barry, and I'm trying to get at the honey in that beehive. Now go away and let me get my treat. Brindle watched again while Barry stood up and swatted at the beehive. After the bees swarmed her and she sat back down, Brindle suddenly realized what was going on. Oh, I see, Brindle said. You are a bear. I have heard that bears love honey more than anything else. Yes, I am a bear, Barry replied, still annoyed. And what are you? I am a magic unicorn, Brindle answered. Do you think that maybe the bees are mad at you because you are hurting their home? Of course, Barry said. But how else am I supposed to get the honey? Have you tried asking them nicely? Brindle asked. I did try that, Barry sighed. But they can only bring me tiny little tastes, and that doesn't work. But they are okay with giving you honey? Brindle asked. Yes, Barry said. But it's not enough. It sounds to me like you are being bratty because you are being a little greedy, Brindle said, but not to be mean. I know, Barry hung her head, and Brindle could feel that she was a little ashamed. But I don't know how else to do it. Well, Brindle said, I am a magic unicorn. I can maybe help you. But first, you need to apologize to the bees for being so greedy and trying to hurt them just to get what you want. Barry looked up. I'm really sorry, you know. I know they were trying to help. Don't tell me, Brindle said gently. Tell it to them. Barry looked up at the bees surrounding the beehive and apologized. I'm sorry. I know you were trying to help, and I wasn't being nice about it. When Brindle could feel that the bees accepted Barry's apology, she nodded. Okay, she said. Now, let's try to do this in a way that doesn't hurt anyone. Barry stepped back from the tree, and Brindle pointed her magic horn up at the beehive. Golden sparkles came from her horn and went into the beehive. When the sparkles came out again, they were dripping with sweet golden honey. Oh, Barry said happily as the honey floated down to her. Barry held her paws up and the sparkles covered them in sticky honey. Barry started licking happily at her paws. Thank you, Brindle. Now I feel happy. I like to help new friends, Brindle said. You can come to find me when you feel the need to have honey again, and I will try to help. Just remember that there may always be a better way to get what you want. That doesn't hurt other people. I will remember that, Brindle, Barry said solemnly. Thank you for helping me, and I will always try to find a better way. Then this is a happy day, Brindle laughed and came to share some of the honey with her new friend, Barry. The End The Raven and the Crow A long time ago in a land filled with knights and beautiful damsels, 
There lived a wicked king. He hated everyone and never had a good day. The king lived in a large castle, and there were many spires all around on the great wall that surrounded the king's domain. The spires were built high into the sky and seemed to go on forever, and in those lived a solitary raven. There was a very long road that led to the king's castle, and if you wanted to go to the castle, you had to pass through the dark forest. There was no other way, you see, as the road went through that dark forest, and that was the only road there was. In the forest, there were many crows living high up in the trees. The crows were always very busy, and they were thought to be the smartest birds in the kingdom. One day, the raven flew out of his high spire and made the trip into the dark forest. He flew high and fast until he reached just about the center of the forest, near where the road passed through it. He landed on the highest branch of the tallest tree he could find and sat there, resting for a moment. Then he took flight again and dove right down near the road, looking for the crows he had heard about that were supposed to be so smart. Before long, the raven found where the crows were searching for winter food to stash away when the snow came and covered the ground. This made it difficult, but not impossible, to find the bugs that they liked to eat every day. When the crows saw the raven, they all stopped their foraging and sat still, staring at him. Then the biggest crow stepped up and spoke to the raven. Hello there, Mr. Raven. To what do we owe this honor? I know that you live in the tallest castle spire, and you serve the king. So why have you left the safety of the kingdom to come into the dark forest? He asked. I have come to find you, so I may ask a question, the raven said. Well, you have found me, so go on, ask away. The large crow said, The king is always irritable and crosses with everyone in the castle, and he doesn't have a wife. Uh, I mean a queen, the raven told him. I have tried singing to him. I have brought him gifts which I made with my own two claws, and I have made many suggestions, but nothing is working. And that is why I came to see you, O oh kindly crow, the raven said. Hmm, said the big crow. I think we might need some time to think this over. Don't you? he asked the raven. Yes, let us have food and drinks, the crow said to the raven. And after our tummies are full, perhaps an idea will alight upon us. All the crows followed the big crow and the raven into the big hollow tree they liked to use for thinking. In the hollow, all the birds sat down around a very long table and pulled up their chairs so they could talk. They talked of the weather, they talked of the forest and the castle, and then finally they talked of the irritable king. Just when they began to wonder if they would ever be able to help the king, one of the younger crows, way down at the end of the table, raised his wing and had something to say. Yes, Sonny, what is it? the big crow asked. Well, does the king know how to meditate? 
little Sunny Crow asked. To his great surprise, everyone around the big table smiled at him and made happy and excited noises. Being young and excitable, little Sunny Crow spoke up again. I think if the king knew how to meditate, then he would know how to be mindful. And if he knew how to be mindful, then he would have already attracted a proper queen, Sunny said. I think you're right, said the raven, getting more excited by the moment. But how do we teach him? the big crow asked. We can't just fly there and tell him he's got it all wrong and that we know how to fix him. Can we? he asked, looking at the raven. The raven was quiet for a moment. Then he said, I know. Let's just ask him if he's thought about meditation. And that way, he'll say that of course he has, because you know he always thinks he is right. And he always thinks that he knows everything. Then we will have planted the seed in the king's mind for him to ask for help, and we will not have to sound like we are telling him anything. Kings don't like to be told what to do, you know, the raven stated. All right, then, the big crow said. Suppose you tell us what we can do to help Mr. Raven, he said. Well, said the raven, you could all fly with me to the castle, and we'll all talk to him together. You all meditate, don't you? He asked the group. Oh, yes, and of course, and we sure do, kinds of things were heard all around the table, as though none of the crows wanted to be known as know-nothings who did not know how to meditate. Then there was a lot of scuffling of feet and shuffling of legs under the table as things became settled. All right, then, the raven said. We are all off to the castle. The band of birds followed the royal raven out of the hollow, and when they were all out there together again, the raven said, We fly in formation. Follow me, boys. And they were off. They flew up and out of the forest and far above the canopy. They flew in proper formation as the raven had instructed. And they arrived at the castle just like that. A proper formation is the right thing for birds who are flying together to do. Then they all followed the raven down and down and watched as he landed on the landing on the top tier of the corner spire. When all the birds were down, the raven turned to them and said, Follow me to my home here in the corner spire, and we'll get ready to see the king. They all followed him again as instructed, and they filed into his home there in the spire. Everybody, have a seat and I will make us all some nice mint tea, the raven said to the group. Mint tea is good for the mind, you know, he told them. Mint tea is good for meditation and mindfulness, he told them. There was a collective, ah, all around, and soon they were all drinking the mint tea. After this, the raven told them that he would have to go to the king's chamber to see what kind of mood he was in, and that he would then come back to collect them. Only then could they all go together to see the king. The raven left them all and went to the royal chamber to see the king. The king was sitting in his huge soft bottom chair in front of a roaring fire poking away at it with his poker. When the raven came in, he did so slowly and carefully, 
as was fitting when one approaches the king. My lord, he said softly, may I have the honor of speaking with you, your highness? The raven asked. Oh, it's you, raven, the king said, turning in his chair to see who it was. Yes, yes, do come in. I would welcome some company, as it is lonely and boring being a king all alone all the time. You know, the king told him. Yes, I suppose it would be that, your highness. But actually, that is what I came to see you about, sire, he announced. What's that you say, then? the king questioned. Well, sire, I have brought some friends from the forest with me, and I would like to request that you allow them to join us, and we will explain our ideas to you, sire. That is, if you don't mind too much, sire, the suddenly nervous raven said. Oh, by all means, go and fetch them, and perhaps we can all sit together around my fire here and roast things to eat. Would you like that, raven? the king asked. Oh, yes, sire, that is a splendid idea. I always count on you to come up with splendid ideas. And there, you have done it again. You are a good and wise king, the raven told him. Never mind that, raven. Go and fetch your friends, and I will be right here waiting for you to return with them. Now go, the king said, making a shooing motion with his hand. Well, the raven was very happy that the king was in an unusually good mood indeed, and hurried back to his home in the spire to get the others. When he arrived, all the crows were in a bantering conversation about what they thought the king needed. One said he needed a vacation. Another said he needed a new horse to ride around the countryside. And yet another said that he needed a queen. The raven heard that and broke in. Yes, the raven said, he needs a queen all right. And that's exactly what we are going to get him if we have to go door to door in the town searching for her ourselves. Say, another small crow said, I think you've hit on a very good idea. If we search the town and tell everyone that the king is searching for a queen, that would be a good thing, he said. Then another of the smaller crows chimed in and said, Hey, why not put up posters all around the town that tell the people that the king is searching for a queen. I do believe that that would really work, you know, he shrieked. Okay, the raven said, that's enough ideas for now. The king is waiting for us, and we must go to his highness now, the raven announced. Everyone got up and ruffled their feathers so that they were all ready to see the king and they filed out of the raven's home, again following him, and marched over to the king's chamber. When they got there, the raven told them in a whisper, Now, everyone be courteous and mindful when in the presence of the king. He is, after all, the king, and do not everyone talk at the same time. We must have order in the king's chamber, or he will become irritated again. And believe me, you do not want that. Everyone shook their heads, yes, in agreement, and they all went in. Ah, Raven, you have brought your friends from the forest. Good, good, very good, he said with a big smile on his kingly face. Find seats, everyone, and let us begin to talk and enjoy ourselves, the king told them. Soon the raven began 
by saying to the king, Sire, do you practice mindfulness and meditation? And then he waited for the king's response. Why, yes, er, uh, no, actually I don't. I have knowledge of the practice and have been meaning to start such a thing. But at this time, no, I have yet to explore mindfulness and meditation. I have heard good things about it, though, the king told them. We would be happy to help you get started, the raven told the king. We are all very good at meditation and can show you everything you need to know about the practice, the raven said to the king. Is that right? the king asked. Well, then let us not waste any more time. We start right now, the king commanded. All the crows took turns, telling the king everything they knew about how to get started in meditation. And then the raven spoke up again. Sire, if you will keep up your meditation and practice mindfulness, you will no doubt have a sense of friendliness and a new sense of attraction to your presence, he told the king. And then there is a high probability you will soon have a queen sitting on her throne by your side to help you rule over your domain. We are going to help you find your queen, sire, a small crow in the back chimed in. Ah, I think a lot of you all, and I don't think I tell you that enough, the king said. In fact, I don't think I tell anyone that at all. All the birds scuffed their shoes and looked down at their feet. Then the raven spoke up. My lord, he began, we will find you a queen, and you will be happy very soon. And your new queen will love you, sire, the raven said. And from that time forward, the king was happy because he knew now that those around him could love him. I just never knew what love felt like, the king said to the birds around him. Then all the crows and the raven lined up and took turns shaking the king's hand and even hugging the unlikely king. From now on, the king said, I will be more mindful of those around me, and I will never be wicked again. I was wrong to ever be that way when I could have chosen to be loved and to love others who I know to love me. That was the day that the king became known as the loving and caring king, and never again did anyone ever call him a wicked king. Always be mindful of others. The End Twist of Fate Sabrina was always a lovely young girl, with a smile that melted the hearts of everyone she met. She had a small, heart-shaped face, with stunning blue eyes and long flaxen hair that draped around her shoulders in soft golden curls. The dimples in her cheeks added to her charm and would often lend to her beauty being a topic of conversation for all those around her. She was a contortionist by trade and worked hard to perfect her craft delighting the audience of the fun-mazing circus with her feats of flexibility. Sabrina was a marvel at bending her arms and legs around in the most intricate ways, leaving onlookers floored by her fluid contortions. It was this air of fluidity 
that made her acts seem easy and flawless. Her talent was anything but easy, and she was no stranger to working long days to prepare herself for her shows. Lately, she had even been learning to perfect aerial acts. Suspended by sheer golden ribbons attached to the top of the circus tent. Sabrina was known for her angelic presence on stage. The main show in the circus was performed in the evening hours, allowing the performers to take advantage of large and sometimes colorful spotlights. When Sabrina was illuminated in this manner, she took away the audience's breath. Her beauty and talent were unmatched, making her an almost perfect performer. The staff had even taken to perfuming the stands of waiting spectators with the scent of roses to add to the mystery of her act. First, the lights in the brightly colored tent would go down leaving everyone in darkness for a moment. Then, the smell of flowers would float through the blackness before a single soft light would flood the arena, revealing Sabrina, entangled in those ribbon-like sheets above the stage. She wore a leotard covered in jewels and glitter that seemed to shift from white to pale pink as the light played off of it. She would twirl around, blending to gasps from the crowds of people below her. She would unravel, then tangle herself again, before an impressed audience. She seemed to float above everyone's head like a fairy, a creature too graceful to be human. Her arms steadied her movements, and also seemed to sway independently of her, lending to the illusion of magic in her act. Toward the end of this ethereal experience, she would hang upside down and allow the glitter to tumble from her open palms. Applause would burst through the silence of her act, a sledgehammer punctuating the dreamy nature of the show. Her set was designed to be dreamlike on purpose. While she was sleeping, she often envisioned that she was weightless. Sabrina would spend her nights in the world of her own creation, drifting through the dazzling stars around her. The cosmos inspired her and always appeared in her sleep as a vast and calming presence. She would dance and spin singing lullabies to a splendid silver moon that possessed a gentle smiling face. As she sang, the words would echo back to her from the loving emptiness of the night. In the morning, she would wake and write down some of her dreams from the night before. These writings were used to build her shows. Sabrina was not gifted with this kind of creativity during the day and relied on her unconscious mind to build her act. This was a secret that she had kept for as long as she had been involved with the fun mazing circus. She loved her circus family and trusted them all, but she did not want anyone to know that she was not the prodigy that they all seemed to believe she was. One night, upon closing her eyes, she dreamt something new, something that would change her life forever. Upon waking, she rolled over in her plush pink bed and frantically searched for her dream journal in the drawer of her nightstand. She quickly wrote down everything that she saw. In her dreams that night, she had a partner in her ribbon act. They were both suspended 
and moving in unison like ballet dancers. The two were lying flat while in the air, with their stomachs towards the ground. They joined hands and spun around in a full circle while using their legs to mimic flower petals opening and closing again. The audience had exploded in cheers at the end of this feat, and Sabrina knew that she had to find a way to bring this act to life. She told the staff that she was in search of a partner, preferably another young girl with similar abilities and a background in contortion. She asked that they make double sure that her new partner was not afraid of heights. Now, management knew that Sabrina was underestimating the process of finding new performers, but they also did not want to let her down because she was such a treasure to the circus. The hunt was on. The circus put up flyers in every town they visited and in all of the newspapers. Fans of Sabrina poured through the doors, eager for a chance to meet and work with their favorite contortionist. Management held so many tryouts to find a performer that could match Sabrina's skill level. In one town, 20 young men and women lined up for a chance to showcase their talents. They were comparatively skilled in their different crafts, but no one was able to keep up with Sabrina. The closest they found was a snobby young lady who was able to fold herself into a suitcase. This was a promising prospect until she laughed at one of the other applicants for falling over during an audition. The circus was very firm about not compromising their morals for profit, and they could never willingly allow someone with a bad character to join their ranks. While all of these failed auditions were taking place, Sabrina was growing more and more frustrated. She was a sweet girl by nature, but the stress of not having a new act was causing her occasionally to lash out at those around her. She had a special friendship with Ellen, the elephant, because their personalities were so similar. Ellen had been doing her best to cheer up Sabrina, but nothing was working. She even offered to help her brainstorm a new act, but to no avail. No one knew that Sabrina's show ideas came from her dreams, and that lately she had been having the same dream over and over again. There was no other choice for her. She had to find a partner for her act. Yet another unsuccessful tryout left management shaking their heads. Everyone was at a loss to how to find the next performer. A city in Ohio produced a young man that was a skillful acrobat, and a town in North Dakota yielded a woman with a talent for swallowing fire. The staff was thrilled to find showmen to add to its roster, but none of them could be used in Sabrina's act. One foggy morning, there was a knock at the door of Sabrina's trailer. One of the circus's talent scouts had come to speak with her. They informed her that they had tried their best, but there is simply no one else out there with her skill level. Sabrina found herself tearing up at the news and asked if they were done holding auditions. The staff member told her that they had one tryout left, but then it was over. She did not want Sabrina to get her hopes up, 
because so many of the other auditions had been fruitless. Sabrina wiped a tear from her own cheek and smiled. If there was one more chance, then there was still hope. The last interview consisted of three performers. Two of them were confused about the meaning of the word contortionist. One of them sang a splendid rendition of the birthday song, and the other did a handstand. The talent agents sighed and cast worried glances at one another. The very last candidate was a small young lady named Leah. She wore shorts and a t-shirt with a mess of blonde hair tied back into a ponytail. She did not have much of a stage presence, and both members of the staff were eager to conclude this failed endeavor. Leah was a shy young lady who had always tried to be humble and approachable. She was in stark contrast to the star-powered Sabrina, who had never seen the value in being relatable. As Leah took the stage, the staff's mouths slowly gaped open in awe. She performed a stylistically perfect dance routine that showcased her abilities as a contortionist. She twisted her arms and legs around one another in graceful and sweeping motions, landing every step in sync with the rhythm of the song that she had chosen. Leah, are you afraid of heights? One of the interviewers asked. Yes, ma'am, but I won't let that stop me from doing anything, Leah said in a soft and shaking voice. They knew that they had found their girl. They introduced Leah to Sabrina, and the two were instant friends. Sometimes you hear people saying things like, You complete me? This was a perfect instance of two opposites coming together and lending the parts of their own personality to assist the other in growing. Sabrina was a ham, and Leah was shy. Sabrina worked with her to increase her confidence and learn how to play to the audience. Leah imparted her technical knowledge on Sabrina and would bring her back down to earth when her ego got the best of her. Around the circus, the two girls became known as the twins, despite how different they were in personality. They loved the nickname, and both girls were so happy to finally find a friend that could empathize with their interests. Sabrina slowly undertook the task of literally showing Leah the ropes. The two girls had a few obstacles to overcome, including Leah's fear of heights. They worked together to get over this by having her confront the issue head on. Sabrina strapped her friend into a safety harness and had her raised gradually from the ground. They did this every day until being suspended up above everyone else became commonplace for Leah. Leah had a good deal to contribute to the team, too, as she was a creative girl by nature. She told Sabrina that she had always been inspired by her performances and dreamed of the chance to create her own routine. Sabrina finally told someone her secret that day. Leah laughed and informed Sabrina that even if the ideas come to her while she is sleeping, they are still her ideas, and she is still the one responsible for the shows. Sabrina had never really thought of it like this and breathed a huge sigh of relief. Leah showed Sabrina some ways to really get her creativity flowing by listening to music and writing. 
Together the two came up with some very successful acts. Sabrina and Leah had been working up to the flower act for what seemed like forever. On the day of the actual show, they were both filled with nervous energy. Leah was very skilled at calming people down, though, and showed Sabrina some breathing exercises to get her worry under control. The girls were able to pull off their performance without a hitch, and every young person in the audience was amazed at the way the two girls spun around in the air, like butterflies. Their show seemed to be magic in nature, with all the wonder that one associates with aerial acrobatics and contortion. They bloomed in the air like an ethereal rose that hung suspended above the imaginations of every member of the crowd. That night would go down in history as one of the most intense circus performances that any of the other staff or audience had ever witnessed. The End <laughs>